and it just, um, they told us we were extinct and they told us our language was dead. And yet everyone in this room speaks my language. You say, Wallaby, Wombat, Corroboree, Boomerang? <laughs> ever, ever heard any of you say, Kuwi? Yeah? Kurenji Bija, which means come here. Um, Paramatta, Paramatta, that's why they're the Paramatta eels, that's, that's what it means, the eels, the place where the eels lay. Cabra, Cabra Matter, Cabra Matter is the head of the waterways before it goes into George's River. Yaguna means now or today. And so there was a lot of language that has been left. Oh, boogie, boogie is to bathe in the boogie board. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and I suspect the Cooper hat went on the Cabra, you know, so. Um, I'm proud to be from the Sydney mob, it's hard, but we're, we're still here and we're very, very grateful to be singing to you and, and I, I talk as a plural because if it wasn't for my ancestors I wouldn't be having these words in my mouth. So I'm very grateful to them. Um, I'd like to uh, sing another uh, clap and speak song and this roughly translates to um, and we're just relearning language. It's not I wasn't taught language from family. Um, the du comes from uh, Annie Jane Cooper. She now passed, beautiful. And her great grandmother was that first legal marriage of black and white in Australia. That's how Black Town got its name. It was from our family. Um, ironic. <laughs> I'm trying to join the freckles together. It's not working. <laughs> but um, Annie Jane used to say, "I never heard the word Darek. Always heard it like a bird call." And I used to get this thing in my head, whoop, 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 whoop. and so I let it out and she burst into tears and she said she hadn't heard that since she was a child. And so that's how I say my, my family name now. So that's Tony Jones. So I, I'm singing a song um, that actually came about from a Bundjalung woman visiting people in England, ironically. Um, these people had a dream about this Aboriginal woman and the next thing you knew there was a conference on and she went to the conference and a woman called Annie Lorraine Murphy Williams uh, had called that woman in and told her to go to the Blue Mountains. She was someone who did Tibetan throat chanting and the fellow at the house who was sharing the house with me, he was a recording artist and he recorded this woman's album. And she said, I was sent to this Blue Mountains, I'm listening, I'm looking for this Aboriginal voice. And she said, and he goes, there's an Aboriginal who lives here. And so I ended up being on her album in England. So thanks, I'm your own. And this one's roughly translated as, maybe tomorrow light, maybe tomorrow love, maybe tomorrow we'll dream together. Bora 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 given to me by my cousin. Um, she was known as the last the Sackville mob. It's okay, she's had kids. <laughs> and um, a lot of, um, within the first five years of settlement, this um, the, the people of Sydney were wiped out through the smallpox. We lost two thirds of the tribe within that first five years. 
And so in turn, um, a lot of people come now and ask us for stories of this place. Mind you, the, your Parramatta Road, your Great Western Highway, your Botany Bay Road, they're all our old walking tracks. And um, so uh, that's the way I came up. <laughs> so I was travelling on the old country. But as for stories and songs and things from the past, a lot of that was gone. Um, but in a way, as the Mutajula women and other women who called me in to talk to me said, our story is now colonisation because it's changed out this country so much. And um, it used to describe your land, your songs, and now my land is very different. And so um, this song was given to me by my cousin Cindy Gores, and she asked not to say that she wrote this story, the song, but she was given to it by her ancestors. And um, that it was to stop some development out west, the ADI side, I don't know if anyone knows it. Um, and it was to actually get men to make good decisions, because men make a lot of decisions now that were actually women's business. And it was 10 years after when the Dunwall released a book about the changing seasons that we found out what Yanana Mama Mama meant. And it was the grandmother's life cycle. So we're not crazy, <laughs> we're just uh, listening. Our land has been forgotten And our laws are disobeyed Our people have been changed <coughs> Will their souls return to us? Our soul and spirit are one And we're watching our land disappear the earth is calling us, and let us all be one. And the shadow of the tree, it hides our shame. The wind carries our voices, and the rain pulls down our souls. Let it go. Did you go? Our colour has been changed and some spirits will return. Those who are true will walk among us and dream. So you must listen to the voices that you hear from afar. And know we walk with you, and know it's time to heal. So come together, learn all our law. Let's come together and heal this land that's ours. Let's all drink together and bring us all to one. And feel us in your hearts. Did you recall? Have a great evening. Jacinta, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Patricia Blackman to come to acknowledge. 
Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests. I'm a local Aboriginal resident and a member of the Asheville Consultative Committee, as well as a member of ANTAR. I work part-time at Asheville Council and also as a cultural worker. So on behalf of the Metropolitan Lands Council, it's an absolute pleasure to be here at the rec recognised forum. Tonight, I bring a message of acknowledgement of the land and the people. I also bring a message of recognition of culture and identity to help promote the vision of working together as one community and achieving as one community. I now welcome everyone to Kataka Walker the Land and the Eora Nation. The people of the Eora Nation, their spirits and ancestors, ancestors will always remain with their land, Mother Earth. Aboriginal people have been a part of this land for more than 50,000 years and we will maintain contact with the land and continue our cultural practices. I now ask everyone to look within inside themselves and pay respect and honour to our elders both past and present and realise the sacrifices made by our community to help build a better future, to be in touch with our rich history which Aboriginal people provide to this country. We need to acknowledge the past, that white Australia does have a black history, to enable us to look to the future, to a vision of healing that will allow us to move together, walking as one, with the vision of hope and strength and a strong cultural identity. And therefore having success in every sector, working together for a better community, just as our elders would want. On that note, I once again welcome you to Wongal Kalika Land under the Year Nation. Thank you. Peter Dixon, I coordinate Marinkal Residents for Reconciliation. Now you're going to have to get your money back because we expected Linda Burney to be the MC. Linda was almost here and something happened in Macquarie Street and she got called back. So she gives her apologies and I give my apologies for messing things up in advance. Okay. Uh, I wish to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Gadigal Wongle peoples of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present, and I thank you for your work. We are also uh, in the local government area of Ashfield, uh, and uh, Ashfield Council has provided these lovely facilities for us tonight, and we're honoured to have the Mayor of Ashfield with us, Councillor Lucille McKenna. Thank you very much. And now firstly, might I also acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to the elders past and present. And of course, to the Aboriginal people that are here present to, tonight. Welcome to Ashfield. We're very, very happy to have you here with us. We're very proud um, that we're able to sponsor this recognition um, evening. We really have been, we feel that at Ashfield we've been doing uh, what we can um, to assist this process and uh, we have, we're very proud. This room that you're in tonight is our fairly new community rooms and uh, it's actually four rooms and the the rooms are named after some of the original Aboriginal people who were on our um, original reconciliation um, Aboriginal consult. It's now the Aboriginal Consultative Committee. It was uh, had a, a former name, but anyway, um, that group got together um, under the um, the leadership of at the time Councillor Cassidy, who was the then mayor, and. Uh, we were uh, one of the first councils to do a reconciliation action plan and uh, we've been steadily working through that now for the last few years and uh, this 
of course, the naming of this room and um, the work that that committee put in was part of um, the, some of the things that we did to acknowledge some of the local people um, here in Ashfield. Um, I really want to um, encourage um, you to, to continue to be involved. Um, recognition of average, constitutional recognition of our Aboriginal people is something that is absolutely vital for this country to move forward and for us to, to move forward as one. We really, uh, we've been lagging the chain on that as well and we really, that's something that we just have to do and um, I'm so pleased to see um, the effort that's been put in to trying to achieve this. Um, I just had a look at this brochure and to see the mix of, of, of people that are actually um, putting their names forward and putting their, their thoughts there and, and, and that is encouraging and I really do hope that this is something that is fairly close, not too far away. So once again, um, thank you all for your efforts because it's the efforts of people like you that are um, are going to see this achieved and welcome to Ashfield again. If we at Ashfield Council can do anything to assist in this process, we're there and happy to be part of it and happy, very happy to host this, this meeting here tonight. So thank you. So uh, Councillor Mark Drury is also here. I don't know whether there are any other councillors from Asheville or from Mar Councillor Law. Okay, thank you. Welcome. And uh, thank you for welcoming us here. The Mayor of Marigold, Councillor Jo Halen, sends her apologies. Uh, I'm not sure whether there are any councillors from Marigold here. Uh, so, um, just uh, some housekeeping. If you need the toilets, they're up on level two. You can go up a little flight of stairs or the uh, lifts are just over there and I'll take you up to level two. Okay, and um, at some stage there'll be a couple of computers where you can sign on to the Recognise campaign and there's other information out the front uh, behind the door. So I want to thank you all for coming tonight to this lovely spot. Uh, the lands of the Gadigan and Wongal peoples, and uh, I thank you for your interest in this topic. It, it is absolutely vital for Australia. It's not the only vital thing, but it is vital. And I'm not going to say anything more about that. Uh, I'm going to invite Professor George Williams, who is the Anthony Mason Professor of Law at the University of New South Wales. He's written and edited 31 books, and he has appeared as a barrister in the High Court in a number of cases, including the Pine Marsh Island Bridge case. Uh, George is going to give us a little overview of the need for constitutional recognition. Thank you very much for sharing with us. for having me here tonight. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and to also say how wonderful it is to see like, such a large turnout at this event. Uh, this idea of recognising Aboriginal peoples in the Constitution has been picking up a lot of steam in the last year or so. We've had commitments now from all of Australia's major political parties that there should be a referendum in this term of government. We've had the Prime Minister say that he will release a draft wording in around September this year saying how he wants the Constitution to bring about recognition. And everything suggests that uh, if those pieces fall into place, that there could be a referendum on this issue next year. And it will be the first referendum of this kind dealing with these fundamental issues since 1967. So it's about 50 years since we've really debated something like this nationally in this country before. But I want to start by asking the question of really what's all the fuss about? Why should we be bothering in tinkering with this document that is now uh, more than a century old that was given to us by the British that does not speak of Aboriginal people and for many people seems almost completely disconnected with their lives. 
Uh, after all, it was Lionel Murphy, an attorney general in the Whitlam government and a high court judge who used to say that he always kept a copy of the constitution by his bedside. He said, uh, suffering from insomnia, he had never found a better cure. <laughs> I would say to you that if you cannot sleep tonight, I challenge you to get past about section 24 before nodding off. It's, uh, it's a tough exercise. So what is it about this document that has suddenly become a national focus? Why are people saying that this document needs to change to recognise Aboriginal Australians? Well, the starting point for me is that Aboriginal people themselves over many years have identified this as something that needs to be done. One among many things, and of course there are many challenges in this space, this is one piece in a larger jigsaw puzzle of things that need to be done to achieve justice in this country and also to help uh, our community broadly, Aboriginal and otherwise, have a shared economic and social future uh, in many areas. Well, why is it that Aboriginal people see the Constitution as part of that story? Why is it one of the pieces of the puzzle that needs to be fixed to achieve justice. It's basically because the lived experience of Aboriginal people is that the Australian Constitution, over the course of generations, has had a profound effect upon their lives, and often for the negative. Noel Pearson has said that the Constitution was designed to fail Aboriginal people, and he's right. It's a document that was actually written with the premise of exclusion. It was written to enable the denial of the vote, to deny Aboriginal people their voice, even their identity, both as a group and as Australians. And what the Constitution does with regard to Aboriginal people really fits into three categories in terms of understanding why it's so fundamental to this debate. And these are things that don't change something tomorrow, that don't put food on a table, but they're the sorts of things that over the course of many years shape us as a nation and shape our ability to move forward in a united and just way. Now the first thing the Constitution does is it sets out lines of power within our society. It sets out who can do what to whom. And if you're an Aboriginal person, there's not much more fundamental when you look at the laws passed in this country than who can do what to them. On their behalf, for them, to them, with or without their consent. The Constitution is the ultimate source of authority for stolen generations, laws and policies of stolen wages of laws that regulated marriage, that restricted the ability of Aboriginal people to move. It is the document, the legal document, that gave authorisation for those things to happen. So if you want to deal with that issue of who can do things for on behalf of Aboriginal people to set up a better system that might enable in the future self-government or all sorts of possibilities, well, the Constitution is something that must be tackled. The second thing the Constitution does is it sets up legitimacy and relationships within our system of government. It says who's important. It says who has to be listened to. It says who gets to make the laws. And here Aboriginal people are completely left out of that story. It means that when laws are made for them, that there's no requirement that they be consulted or listened to, or even that they have a power and legitimacy within our system of government. The whole thing is premised upon their exclusion, on the notion at the time of federation that Aboriginal people were a dying race. And the problem, as it was called then often, was how to manage that race as it exited from the Federation. The framing of this document was not conceived as a document to build a future for Aboriginal people, but to manage the dying race. And this, of course, was a time when it was thought that a genocide had been committed in Tasmania, and it was thought that that was something that would likely be replicated throughout the rest of the country. So it's no surprise that Aboriginal people weren't mentioned, weren't given legitimation, weren't set up as a group to negotiate with, they were simply left out. And that's very telling in terms of their place within our legal system and our politics. And the third thing the Constitution does is it sets up a set of national aspirations that helps to shape our national identity. Who are we? What do we stand for? Is it the rule of law? Is it equality? Is it justice? What are we striving for as a political community? What are the sorts of laws that we want our politicians to make on our behalf? Now, the Constitution speaks a lot about free trade and uh, economics, but when it comes to these issues of social justice, it's utterly silent. And so when it comes to that question, what are we as a people striving for as a political community? Aboriginal people simply don't figure in the Constitution. Now, I don't want to suggest the Constitution provides all of the answers to any of those questions, but it is part of the most fundamental way of providing answers. It is the birth certificate of our nation that sets up who's got the power, who matters, and where we're heading. 
and that's something that has a generational significance. And it's something that when you trace back the injustices done to Aboriginal people, the Constitution often looms very large in that, in authorising, in enabling, uh, because it was drafted in a way that, uh, if you like, was drafted designed to fail, to use the words of Noel Pearson. Now, the Constitution also it's recognised, not just in a legal sense, but in other senses too, has a profound effect in this area that means that it's got to be grappled with, it's got to be dealt with. And there are many health professionals and other people who, using things such as the social determinants of health, as it's called, have drawn linkages between problems with our legal system and the fact that Aboriginal people suffer higher rates of mental, physical and other illnesses. Again, there's no suggestion the Constitution is the primary or even a large cause, but it is part of the problem. For example, the Australian and New Zealand Royal College of Psychiatrists looked at this issue of constitutional recognition, no legal background to them, purely in the area of mental health, and this is what they said about why recognition is important. The lack of acknowledgement of the people's existence in a country's constitution has a major impact on their sense of identity and value within the community and perpetrates discrimination and prejudice which further erodes the hope of Indigenous people. There is an association with socio-economic disadvantage and subsequent high rates of mental illness, physical illness and incarceration with the failure to include a people within the nation's constitution. And that group of psychiatrists went on to strongly argue for recognition, saying that in their own work, from what they had seen, having a moment of inclusion, of recognition, overcoming injustices, is something that would not just have a legal effect, but is something that would have a broader effect in the community. And over time, a long time, could help to address a range of other problems. Well, what is it specifically that's wrong with the Constitution that leads to these problems? And it does go back to the drafting of the document in 1901. In this era of the white Australian policy where Aboriginal people were cast as a dying race, we've got a Constitution that reflects those views. We've got a constitution that if you read it, as our school kids do, to get a sense of who we are in our history, you very plainly get the view that we have no history that needs to be recognised other than that history that began in 1788. And if you read the constitution, frankly, you get the impression that nothing of significance happened on this continent prior to 1788. There's no mention, no recognition, and that's very powerful, not just in terms of exclusion, but in terms of forming values. And one of the reasons I'm such a strong supporter of this debate is I've got a primary school son, seven years of age, who in a few years will start studying these things, and I'm very concerned, I think as other people should be, that he's going to study a system that's premised upon that exclusion, that doesn't recognise with pride and acknowledge the injustices in a way that will give him a picture of who we are and where we should be heading as a community. But it's not just the lack of recognition that's a problem. Uh, when the Constitution was drafted, it had clauses that were absolutely discriminatory. Section 127, for example, said that Aboriginal people could not be counted in reckoning the numbers of people of the Commonwealth. Uh, they weren't treated as human beings in a way that could even be counted to determine how many people lived on this continent. Now that clause, fortunately, was removed in the 1967 referendum. We moved beyond that. Aboriginal people could be counted and in particular could be counted fully in the census. We also had a clause, section 5126, which was called the racist power and still in the constitution. It enables the federal parliament to make laws for any group because of their race and it was put in the constitution in the words of our first prime minister, Edmund Barton, to enable our federal parliament to make laws for the coloured and inferior races of the Commonwealth. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that that was the object. This was the white Australian era. And our framers wanted a power of this kind so that they could, through their parliament, make laws that prevented people because of the colour of their skin having certain jobs, living in certain areas, and living a full life as a member of the community. Now, that power did not originally extend to Aboriginal people, but it was extended to them in 1967. So if you like, the federal parliament got power for Aboriginal people, but through the prism of a power that was put there to enable discrimination. And indeed, it's one of the great problems with the 67 referendum, is this racist power was not changed. Nothing beneficial was put in the constitution. It's simply a law to make laws about race, where they have anything to indicate it needs to be used positively. 
Now, unless we think that that possibility of using it for negative purposes is just hypothetical, I just remind you that in the last 15 years, the Racial Discrimination Act has been overridden twice in Australia, on both occasions directed at Aboriginal people. In the uh, Native Title Amendment Act of 1998 and also the Northern Territory Intervention, both of those laws have a clause in them which say, to the extent that these laws are racially discriminatory, they override the Racial Discrimination Act. So I'm talking here about a real and ongoing possibility. Put in our constitution in 1901, extended to Aboriginal people in 1967, that still enables people to be treated differently and adversely because of their race. Uh, if you like, it's a, a constitutionalised form of bigotry that is written into the document. <laughs> now, I'm not aware of any constitution in the world today that still has a clause like this, the racist power. South Africa certainly did. Many nations have. But as far as I know, we're the only nation today that still recognises that our parliament can discriminate negatively on the basis of a person's race. And as someone who works in this area, it's a sense of shame to me that we as a community still have this, that we are the only nation, that when people overseas do say Australia has a problem with racism, they can point to our most fundamental law as providing concrete evidence of that. And uh, it's something, as I've said, that is still used. And uh, indeed, in a case I appeared in the High Marsh Island Bridge case, dealing with Aboriginal women's secret business, on that occasion, the Commonwealth even used the power in the words of their top lawyer to say that it enables discrimination. It's got a racist premise. And at that age, in that year, 1998, it still argued that it can be used to enact racially discriminatory laws. And indeed, the High Court left open that possibility. The High Court essentially said, if you want to change, it's up to the people to change it. Not the courts. You need to hold a referendum to actually bring that about. So in terms of what we need to do, we need to start with the issue of acknowledgement. We need a constitution that spells out our history with crime, acknowledges injustices, acknowledges connections to land, acknowledges indigenous languages, culture. We need language that Aboriginal people have drafted that provides the form of recognition that they want to see. We need also to remove these clauses that are still based on the idea of race, not just the racist power, but there's another one as well in section 25 called races disqualified from voting which still recognises that any person in a state election can be stopped from voting because of their race. Those clauses need to go. We don't want any clause in our constitution that means people are treated differently because of the colour of their skin. And thirdly, we need to put something in our constitution that moves beyond these racist premises that in my view actually says it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of race. We should move beyond authorising this to prohibiting it. Surely we've now arrived at a point where we can say as a community no law, no policy of any government should discriminate against any person on the basis of their race. That's something that the government's own expert panel on this recommended. And I think in terms of doing something, not just about symbolism, which is important, but about substance and providing for a constitution that treats people with equality, having a document that outlaws racial discrimination, I think is surely what we should be striving for. Thank you. like to take a seat at the table. Um, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for making constitutional law interesting. A few people have that gift. And you know, thank you. Nicole Watson is a member of the Viri Gubba people and the Yugamba language group and the Senior Researcher of the Jambana Indigenous House of Learning at the University of Technology, Sydney. Thank you very much for coming to respond uh, to what George has said to us. Good evening. At the outset, I'd like to pay my respect to the traditional owners of the land. Uh, I thank Barrackville residents for reconciliation and also the Inner West and Hub Group. And finally, I thank all of you for coming here tonight uh, to engage in this very important conversation. The first point that I would like to begin with is acknowledging that there has always been a diversity of opinion among Aboriginal people in relation to the steps that
that need to be taken in order for us to move forward. Contrary to some media reports, differences of opinion are not a sign of dysfunction in our communities, but rather are necessary for us to grow. And differences of opinion are to be expected when we are discussing important issues that will have significant impacts on our rights. So while there are many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who support constitutional recognition, there are also many, like myself, who are ambivalent. And over the next eight or nine minutes, I'm going to advance three reasons why I am ambivalent about constitutional recognition. Firstly, we don't know what constitutional recognition will actually look like. Two years ago, the expert panel on constitutional recognition released its very detailed and well-considered report. And I would urge all of you to read um, this great report. Now, there was some merit to the panel's recommendations, in particular, a new section 116A that would prohibit racial discrimination by the Commonwealth, a state or a territory. Now in spite of having two years to consider the recommendations, the Abbott government is yet to tell us which ones it will support. Until it does so, I think that we should reserve our judgment. Secondly, constitutional recognition is not the same as self-determination. Self-determination is what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people really need. Constitutional recognition may create an, a positive environment in which we can discuss self-determination, but it will not necessarily lead to a framework for the realisation of self-determination. Many Aboriginal people, including myself, believe that a treaty is a proper means for the realisation of self-determination. And this call for a treaty, this call for self-determination has been made by Aboriginal people for decades. One of our early writers, a Wiradjuri man, Kevin Gilbert, published the first political text by an Aboriginal person called Because a White Man Will Never Do It in 1973. Now Gilbert argued that Aboriginal people had to enjoy a degree of autonomy so that we could undo the damage inflicted by colonisation. <coughs> and in his book, he laid out three tiers for that to go forward. Self-determination, the payment of substantial compensation, and the creation of an Aboriginal land base. Now, I would argue that if you look at the different platforms uh, placed in the public sphere by Aboriginal people over the decades, there are common themes, the most prevalent of which is self-determination. Now, this shouldn't be news to any of us in Australia. In 1991, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody made it very clear that conditions would not prove for Aboriginal people until we achieved self-determination. More recently, the report Little Children Are Sacred was unequivocal in its demand that governments abandon <coughs> proposed solutions in favour of genuine partnerships with Aboriginal communities. Now, I feel like I've just spent the first half of my 10 minutes, so I will be very quick, but I will say that when you look overseas, particularly in North America, there is evidence 
<coughs> that Aboriginal peoples only ever really thrive when they have genuine self-determination. And research that is very clear on this point is produced by the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic <coughs> Development. Uh, if anyone wanted to, to uh, consider that further. to constitutional recognition is that although it's, it, it is important in terms of a nation-building exercise, I think that it's also a distraction from significant changes to Indigenous affairs, many of which are, are um, occurring under the radar. Now we know of significant cuts to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services. If any of you read Ross Gittin's column in today's Herald, we've seen that staggering statistic that Indigenous people are 18 times more likely to be incarcerated than our fellow Australians. And yet the Abbott government is cutting funds to our legal services. The Abbott government is also cutting significant funds <coughs> to our only national representative body, Congress. Congress is our only means of projecting an independent Aboriginal voice into Canberra so that our people have a say in relation to policies and programs that have significant impacts on the ground. Now, such an environment is making many Aboriginal people, including myself, quite anxious. And this anxiety is not conducive to working together in any campaign for constitutional recognition. Now, finally, I also want to mention the Northern Territory intervention. At face value, it has nothing to do with constitutional recognition. But this was a series of laws targeting Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory on the basis of race. People's lands were confiscated by the Commonwealth. People were subject to an income management regime on the basis of their race. The Howard government deprived us of a public debate in relation to the intervention. And when the former government extended the intervention by way of the Stronger Futures reforms, they also deprived us of a public debate. But I feel that it is disingenuous for us to talk about coming together in this constitution when we have racially discriminatory laws affecting thousands of people in the Northern Territory. Um, so I think that, that that is my 10 minutes. <laughs> to heal those wounds. But we deserve politicians better than the Abbott government. Oh. <laughs> Nicole, another interesting talk about the Constitution. Thank you. <laughs> and very much thought-provoking. So, I'm a little bit confused about the microphone situation, but we really uh, want to uh, get you discussing things and talking about things. It's really been great, uh, three groups working together to plan this forum, the Women's Reconciliation Network, ANTAR in the West, and uh, America Residents for Reconciliation, and that's our aim together, uh, to get uh, discussion going. Um, there are some other microphones somewhere. Oh, there they are. Ah, thank you. Boy, I'm a hopeless chair. Uh, okay, so, and um, maybe there's someone like Andrew who could take, uh, yeah, my friend Andrew, yeah, okay. You're a friend, it's very obvious. So, questions, we, okay. Yes, I wonder if uh, George could uh, comment on whether they're not mutually exclusive, uh, the question of the treaty and the question of the constitution. Sure. So the uh, the question is, 
Now it's on, I think. The question is whether the, uh, the recognition agenda is exclusive to that of a treaty. And look, my starting point is I agree with Nicole. I actually think a treaty is long overdue in this country. And one of the books I've published is called Treaty, and it talks about how we can get there. And I also agree that uh, the self-determination agenda is absolutely central and vital. And uh, in terms of changing things uh, on the ground, uh, it's in many ways will have a much more profound impact than anything to do with constitutional recognition. So I, I think she's absolutely spot on on those things. I would simply say that they're both things that need to be done and that uh, nothing that has been drafted in the constitutional recognition area would in any way cross out the ability to have a treaty. In fact, one of the things I would have liked to have seen the expert panel recommend is a special recognition or a path towards a treaty as part of the recognition agenda. Now, they haven't done that, and it's unlikely the Abbott government would do that. But um, having, a, having a constitution which eliminates the ability for racial discrimination, that provides recognition, will, in my view, create a better platform for discussing a treaty. Um, and I think the pragmatic reality of where we are with all of our political parties is until we get this recognition agenda done properly and have a proper constitution to deal with these things, we're not likely to move on to that treaty conversation. I hope it will open it up, if you like, in a way that doesn't seem possible at the moment. So in many ways, I hope they're complementary. I certainly don't see them as being antagonistic. The only way they could be is if something was drafted in a way that uh, sought to foreclose the making of a treaty. But look, if that happened, I'd be one of the first people to speak out against it. And I think if that happened, there'd be no doubt that Aboriginal people in the community would say this is a terrible idea. And here Nicole's also right that if we give people a blank cheque, it's a rotten idea. We've got to be vigilant about what we're getting. And it's only if they actually deliver something that is of worth and doesn't undermine other aspirations that you could support it. But I'm hopeful that that, that could be done. Okay, gentlemen, uh, in the third row, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Hello. Yeah. Yep. Going well? Yeah. Uh, George. The old constitution is still back in England. Bob Hawke couldn't bring it back from the English Parliament because it's a property there. The act that related to the Australia Act, following the Australia Act in 2003, the constitution the act of constitution by the Australian government to accept certain things back. Now, the preamble to that is, is taken from the 1900s of the first constitution. With the Queen's heirs to inherit this country after she dies, the Crown. Now, to my knowledge, a preamble and what organisation I'm under is under the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, uh, the Land Rights Act in New South Wales. The preamble covered, firstly, that Aborigines owned the land in New South Wales, if you look at it properly, and therefore he overrid the federal government in recognising Aborigines within the states under the state law under the, to make laws for Aborigines in legislation under the state. And the Commonwealth came up here and said, no, don't do it. So to me, a federal national land rights with the gross national product as the base for it, like the New South Wales one, which was the land tax, which was asked for from the New South Wales government by other people, but the Aboriginal team that was there asked for the state gross product. Therefore, it would have brought in everybody in New South Wales to pay land uh, to pay taxes. Now, the gross <coughs> national product in Australia today, with the land rights in legislation covering that as a background for so much money being stored away to to get the to start off the uh, the gross national product and a percentage of that throughout Australia we've got all non-Aborigines including mining companies and all the big 
drought warning companies, coal companies, and other, other businesses paying, and including people who walk through the streets. That's coming out of the GST that they pay when they go into Woolworths and Coles, or Myers, or David Jones. So, to scrap all that, as the, if you don't want a, a political fight in this country to make yourselves look bad overseas through the Constitution, now, tell me the difference between the, the Australian Constitution now that was passed in Canberra and the Constitution that Bob Hawke couldn't bring back from England. Well, you're absolutely right that uh, Australia has a Constitution because the British gave it to us, and in fact our Constitution is contained in a British Act of Parliament, and that's another thing I'd like to see fixed. Bring on the Republic. I'd say. Yeah. Well, the Queen has consented to give certain parts of well, the we, we have that a document that, uh, in which the Crown is absolutely embedded and uh, we're a constitutional monarchy and all of those things. And we have a head of state on the other side. You're absolutely right about all of those things. And what I would say is this recognition debate won't fix any of those things. Uh, I think we should fix them. I'm passionately a supporter of it, but that's the Republic debate. And I think if you learn something in this area, it's that don't pick too many fights at once. Uh, if this is going to be won, there's got to be a bit of pragmatism about this and uh, we need to recognise that if you're on a referendum, uh, Labor has an appalling record of getting referendums up. Labor's put 25 referendums since Federation and does anybody know how many of those 25 have actually got up? One. Only one. Not even two. You're overshooting by a big margin. There. One out of 25 have got up and that was under Ben Shipley in 1946. Labor has a 96% failure rate. The Conservatives have about a one in three success rate. It's much better. And, um, you know, unless you get bipartisan support, these things always fail. So uh, if you want the government to be on side, they have to be, despite all of the awful things they're doing, and I don't resolve for that for one moment. The fact is, if this particular agenda is going to get up, it's more likely to get up under the Conservatives, which limits what can be achieved. But still, you've got to ask, um, can we achieve enough that really does make this worthwhile? But otherwise, bring on the Republic. I think it's the so best. So everything thing remains the same. Well, no, the other Republic, areas, yes. And no. I got, I've seen a hand here, a hand there, hand at the back, and a hand at the back. So, uh, firstly. Uh, this just in response. No, 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 no sorry. Oh, sorry. In the front. Uh, you're the fourth. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm, I'm a member of the Stolen Generations. I'm um, the only son of eight siblings. Um, um, of Dave and Betty Leon. Um, part of the Birupai Warama people. Birupai on my father's side, it's David, and, and my grandparent, um, Samuel, on, on the other side, it's Waramai. Um, I heard about the treaty on Koori Radio again, get, um, again that, that debate came up again, Nicole. Um, like there was a discussion that um, it's very, it might divide the nation, that, that true. And, because um, this is a learning process for me, yeah. There are some people who would argue that, and... It hasn't worked in other countries, has it? would argue that it would divide the nation, just as um, the Conservatives argue that the Mabo decision would divide the nation, and then the Whig decision would divide the nation. Um, I agree that... Look, I, I agree that in the current sorry. I, I agree with George in the current political environment it's unlikely that we would get consensus on a treaty. But I think there are other things to consider as well. And the first of which is that in the past decade there has been an emergence of an agreement making culture in Aboriginal communities. Aboriginal people have broken thousands of agreements with mining companies, governments, local councils, uh, universities, hospitals. Why couldn't we use those negotiating skills that we've developed, that governments have developed, uh, to broker a treaty? The, um, the other thing is that there's been a lot of intellectual heavy lifting in this respect. The Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation considered the issue of a treaty. Pat Dodson, when he was the chair of, of that body, uh, did a lot of work on a, po the, a possible national treaty commission. Um, and also, as, as I said, it could provide a framework for self-determination. 
if we are serious about closing the gap in this country, then we have to talk about self-determination. <clears throat> So the gentleman uh, there, yes. Hi. Um, so I'm looking at this leaflet and I'm seeing the leaders of the four largest political parties saying that they're on side. I suspect they that not as many of them will be on side if whatever whatever referendum is proposed would do things like prevent say, the Northern Territory um, intervention from happening. Given, given that reality, I'm, I'm sorry, my question is to you, Nicole. Um, if what um, Tony Abbott comes up with in September does appear to be you know, not much to be excited about, would you still support somebody like me, privileged white male born in this country, to get behind that, or would you rather see me direct my energy behind other issues? That's a good question. Should I stand? Yes, yes. Please. At the end of the day, my, I would urge you to be as informed as you can be. And, and the first step is really to read the expert panel's report. Um, uh, my advice would be to be to get as much information as you possibly can, and the first step is to read the expert panel's report. Uh, me personally, I would not support a change that was merely symbolic. The extraordinary amount of effort that Aboriginal people and our supporters would have to undergo in order to effect a change that is really going to have little impact on relationships between Aboriginal people and Australian parliaments is not something that I would support. And I don't really think that you could compare such a referendum to 1967. 1967 was all about improving conditions for Aboriginal people by giving the Commonwealth the power to make laws in relation to us. It was genuinely a grassroots movement that picked up uh, from the work of Aboriginal people and our non-Aboriginal supporters from the 1950s. Um, if this was just a symbolic change, it really would not have that grassroots support, I don't think. So there was a hand up right in the back there. Yes, yes. Right in the back corner, yep. Switched off by the way. Sorry, I think I forgot what I was going to say now. But um, <laughs> mine's was more of a comment. And put, put the microphone on. Mine's on. It's 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 on. But I think recognition is the biggest load of bullshit that you have got to hear. Reconciliation, even though it was a good gesture, but it was up by John Howard. It didn't change anything, just as the sorry day didn't change anything, just as I agree with that. But this will not change anything for Aboriginal people, but to keep us down. It, it won't change anything in a sense because Tony Abbott still takes away our, our legal aid funding. Still supports the because the anti intervention. So why is it that this guy with good intentions supposedly wants to help all these Aboriginal people, but yet he's doing these things in the in the you know like a magician? Here's the hand. Here's what I'm really doing down here. And that's that's what I think of this recognition. I just don't think it's going to help Aboriginal people in any way by means. And I think the treaty is the right way. Because that's the only thing that's going to change it. Because that means it keeps them honest. Us promise, and, it's, and it's, that's the only thing that's going to get us gold. Not this recognition that's just oh shit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said that was a comment. Yeah. Okay. So in the back row. Um, with regard, Nicole, to what you said about not wanting to vote for something you don't even know what it is. I sort of spotted that in the early stages of joining ANTAR and getting involved with this campaign. So Black Clown, um, ANTAR in Surrey Hills, 
and Antar Blue Mountains are currently setting up um, sort of forums and workshops <coughs> where people can talk about it. And one of the girls at Antar Surrey Hills has found a link where you can actually make submissions and have it come from you, not this is what we th think ought to be the blooming constitutional recognition thing. Yeah, I wouldn't vote for something, I didn't know what it was going to be. Thanks, good to hear you talk. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, I'd like to ask about the South Pacific Islander Act because um, from a, a person from the heritage of when that first contact happened, Ben Along was very clear about our real estate and who was the people who belonged to different areas. Never did my family sign a piece of paper that said you had right to this country. Never did my family sign a piece of paper that said um, that you had right over our people. And for me, it's, it's uh, a constant battle. And again, I want to get back to the fact that we've got to look after the, the earth here. Uh, it's not just about us as humans, because our family tree goes far beyond us as human beings, you know. Our family tree goes to our animals, our plants, salt water, fresh water, muddy water, what soil, you know, red sands, people. So for me, where is the power going to come to the people? And when is uh, uh, the law that has been here for 40, 60,000 years going to be acknowledged? This is the problem, is that the, the power is going to everybody to make decisions on this country, but we have no power to put our law back into this country. And I think that's where people are feeling um, disconnected. <laughs> Does anyone know about the South Pacific Islander Act? Not really, no. no. Okay. Sorry, uh, if research. Yeah. Phil Crowley from the Reconciliation of Western Sydney. And my question relates to the United Nations Declaration of Rights Indigenous People, which uh, we've agreed to. I don't know that we've formally signed it, but certainly as a nation we've agreed to. Within that uh, declaration is the provision for self-determination of Indigenous people. So why is it that we haven't been able to force home a lot harder to our governments the need for us to introduce either a treaty that actually does deliver self-determination or a provision within the expert panel's recommendations that we should actually enact laws to ensure uh, what Aboriginal people richly deserve, and that's our self-determination or, if you like, sovereignty. Yes, uh, certainly Australia has now agreed to that uh, UN Declaration about the rights of Indigenous peoples. And I would say that Australia is a fantastic international citizen when it comes to agreeing to all sorts of international human rights standards. <laughs> a model international citizen when it comes to the treatment of asylum seekers. We've signed the Refugee Convention, we've done those things, we've uh, signed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. and. You know, we're really good at the international stage. It just breaks down when we actually get to implementing these things. And that's the answer. Um, to, be, to be frank, we're two-faced about these things. We love to speak outwardly about how we protect human rights, but our record of doing so at home is often very poor when we deal with the most disadvantaged and vulnerable. And it means that we have recognised the worth of, worth of self-determination, but without one iota of a political commitment to implement it. And that's across both parties. And I want to say here that, you know, I agree, a treaty is the most obvious way of doing this. I'm a strong supporter of a treaty. Um, but uh, one of the major problems we have here is our politicians are not. And it's not just they're not, they're poisonously opposed, in my experience. Warren Mundine recently raised the prospect of a treaty, and it led Shane Newman, the shadow minister for Aboriginal Affairs from the Labor Party, to say over my dead body. He could think of nothing more counterproductive in Australia today. He's fundamentally wrong. But that's the view of the Labor Party on this issue. And uh, one of the reasons I support recognition, even given it won't achieve some of the things that people want, is my assessment is until we actually get to the point of recognising Aboriginal people in the Constitution, doing so through acknowledgement and eradicating the poison of racial discrimination for that document, I can't see any possibility we're going to be able to negotiate a treaty that's fair or even gets to first base. And uh, that's, that's a political judgment, I may be wrong on that. It's partly pragmatic that I think with these things you take steps. We can't get to a treaty now. There's really no chance of getting the sort of treaty we'd like to see. Nicole's absolutely right. Agreement making is the way to go. But a treaty with political recognition and self-determination, 
well, you know, Tony Abbott's better on this than the Labor Party. Um, you know, it's sad to say, but you give a speech last year about the act of recognition where you talked favourably about the Treaty of Waitangi. First time I'd heard him say that. But uh, until a party like the Labor Party will actually move beyond over my dead body, you know, we're talking about the generational change here, and the question is if it is, if it is a generational change, what do we do in the interim to actually build the momentum towards doing that? And again, that's one of the reasons why I think eradicating racial discrimination, the recognition agenda has worked. It's not everything you want, but it may be a step on the way. Yeah, that we can actually change the language over a long period of time. So in our advocacy to governments, we can actually quote the articles of the declaration consistently. If we do that enough over a very long period of time, the articles of the Declaration will become part of the common parlance, and that's what we have to do. Well, friends, uh, we are going to have another time for discussion uh, after our next two speakers. So, uh, George and Nicole, thank you for providing the discussion. So, uh, three groups have come together to organise this night, Women's Reconciliation Network, um, Antar Inner West and Marical Residence Reconciliation. Uh, they are each and all of them members of the New South Wales Reconciliation Council. And so it's uh, great to have the CEO of the New South Wales Reconciliation Council with us tonight, Kirsten Gray, a proud Mooriwari woman from the Kamalaroi Nation in northern New South Wales. Thank you, Kirsten. Good day. Good evening, everybody. Good day. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for that warm welcome. Um, as he indicated, my name is Kirsten Gray, and I'm a proud Milleroy, Milleroy woman. Um, my family house is in Paduga and Bree in Northern New South Wales. And as he mentioned, I'm currently the CEO of the New South Wales Reconciliation Council. Um, but also have a background as a solicitor and in Indigenous Human Rights Policy. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land we're meeting on tonight, um, that of both the Gadigal and Wongal people of the Eora Nation, um, and pay my respects to Elders past and present <coughs> and future. Um, it's because of them that we're here today. I'd also like to acknowledge Linda Burney, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, and it's worth mentioning that she was the inaugural chair of the New South Wales Reconciliation Council, as it was then in 1997. The council is the peak body for reconciliation in New South Wales that's charged with addressing the unfinished business of reconciliation. We're a membership-based organisation made up of a community of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people throughout the state. We have a growing membership base made up of individuals and 28 local reconciliation groups. I'd like to acknowledge some of our members who are here tonight for helping out with this event um, and, and also the anti inner west group. And as a bit of a shameless plug, um, encourage those of you who would like to get more involved in this space uh, to think about becoming members and go and check out our website. We'll come and harass me for more information later on. Hey. Tonight I wish to talk briefly about the significance of recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution, in the bigger journey of reconciliation and I thank the other panellists for their perspectives and I hope I can add something valuable to this discussion. A guiding principle of the expert panel stipulated that any proposal for change must not only be supported by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples but a majority of Australians. It must be technically and legally sound but of course it also needs to be something that contributes to a more reconciled and unified nation. To me, reconciliation is about three fundamental things. Rights, relationships, and respect. Recognition of fundamental rights, relationship building between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, and basic acknowledgement of the unique place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in this country's history. <coughs> to me, these are all things encapsulated by the current process to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution. The New South Wales Reconciliation Council recently held our own awareness raising event to support the push for constitutional recognition. We held our inaugural recognition festival down on Ewan Country and 
Some of our members who are here tonight attended that event, and I thank you for that. Down in Jervis Bay in the stunning surrounds of Budere National Park, the festival was a two-day mini-cultural event where around 200 people gathered to learn more and show their support for constitutional recognition. Not only was the festival a great way to showcase local culture, but it was also a helpful exercise in seeing how culture and country can be a great vehicle for talking about constitutional recognition and reconciliation. I remember talking to Uncle Paul McLeod, an elder from your country, who spoke of how, his journey, of how this journey to recognition is not only an important means of acknowledging and respecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, but that it also plays an important role in the valuing and continuation of culture itself. I think there's a bit of a perception out there in the community that since the bridge walk and the apology, <coughs> that reconciliation has been achieved and or that there's little relevance of that topic today. I don't think you'd be surprised to, to hear that I disagree with that. Um, I think there's still much work to be done and I think that's why we're here tonight having this discussion because there are many steps um, that lay ahead of us that need to happen. I think that this perception is also due to many misconceptions out there about what the 1967 referendum achieved for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Whilst I believe that the 1967 re referendum can be credited with really sparking the reconciliation movement in Australia, it also created a lot of popular myths about what that change meant and, and had some unintended consequences as well, and George has spoken to some of those already. A lot of these narratives incorrectly uphold it as a time that gave Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people citizenship, equal rights, and even voting rights. When in actual fact, the changes gave the government the power to make laws for Aboriginal people and allowed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be included in the census. The unfulfilled optimism and status of that process, which was a watershed moment in this country and a testament, a real testament to the likes of people like Faith Bandler, is what brings us to this current campaign to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution. And in many ways, I see it as the unfinished business of the 1967 journey. Whilst the process back then certainly brought about many changes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the Constitution still has ties to our racist past. The changes in 1967 did not eliminate discrimination. Many people are really quite shocked when they hear that the current Constitution still discriminates on the basis of race, that it permits laws regulating people of coloured or inferior races and can disqualify people, can disqualify voters on the basis of their race. And this is not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but people of all races. Despite all of the efforts of 1967, our constitution is still silent on the unique place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in this country. <laughs> silent on our history, our relationship with the land, our presence. In many ways, it still perpetuates that myth of terra nullius. Unlike the constitution of other countries, which acknowledge and affirm the rights of their first peoples, the founding document of our country is silent on the place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the narrative of Australia. This process to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our constitution is really about our shared history, yours and mine, and I believe it should appear in our founding document. The Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation once said that reconciliation is about both the practical measures to overcome disadvantage, but also the larger structural and symbolic changes that build a better, more unified and inclusive nation. The process of constitutional change is an exercise in both of these things, both of which are important, I believe, for moving our country forward. Practically, constitutional recognition will eliminate some of the discrimination I've already spoken about. But on a symbolic level, it will embed our history and our existence as the First Peoples into one of this country's most important documents. For many people who are wondering about the, significant, about the difference constitutional recognition will make, it begins with the acknowledgement it can only set, on, set us on a path to better things and tackling bigger questions on the rights agenda, many of which we've spoken about tonight. As Tordo Sandsbury, an Aboriginal man from South Australia, put it, a better future begins with the acknowledgement of a simple truth and a truth in constitutional recognition. We were here and we are still here. 
for while that simple truth continues to not be acknowledged in our, by our country in its highest documents, how can we expect things to get better? And I believe symbols are important. They tell us about who we are, what we value, and they inspire our action. If constitutions are our nation-defining documents, then its content should say something about who we are as people. For the US, some of these things are around the right to bear arms, separation of church and power and state, and free speech. There are others, but these are some that really resonate with people. But what of Australia? Do we really want our nation-defining document to, to be confined to the rigid thinking of 1901? Or do we want to show the world who we are and what is really important to us today? The fact that our constitution says more of inanimate objects, of lighthouses and buoys, and of the Queen, speaks to, the, speaks to the historic exclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and really highlights the need for change. And this goes to the third iron reconciliation I was talking about earlier, the importance of respect. And I believe this is fundamentally about respect, about acknowledging that we are here, acknowledging our elders and those who came before us and removing the ability to discriminate against us. This is our opportunity to do something about it. As with the National Apology, I believe that this process for constitutional recognition has the potential to be another healing moment for our country, an important way to build better relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people and to right the wrong of the historic exclusion and discrimination against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. As with the Apology, I don't think that our journey for rights or equality ends with constitutional recognition. I don't think that this process is going to be the magic bullet that makes everything better, um, but I certainly think that it's an important step towards progressing rights for our peoples and removing the archaic and racist thinking that really seems to be embedded in our constitutional DNA. I believe that making this change can only enhance future debates about rights, about treaties and about self-determination, all discussions which I believe aren't mutually exclusive to the current push for change we're talking about. But this change won't happen, won't just come about because it has multi-party support, although that is an important element of this journey. It is a people's movement, and it is, if it is to emulate in any way the success of 1967, the process for change must be backed by a majority of Australians. The recognised movement has close to 180,000 supporters <laughs> and is growing. If you believe in reconciliation and recognition, then I think you have a role to play. Get out there and spread the word to your local communities, to your organisations, corporates and schools. And a good way of doing it is by having the event that we're having tonight. Join and support the journey to recognition when it comes to New South Wales later this year. If we all spread the message of the importance of constitutional recognition to a new person, to new circles, we can get there. As I said, this is a people's movement and it is the people who will get us over the line. I really hope that in 20 years' time, my daughter's generation can look back on this process with the same pride as we do, as I do, uh, with the 1967 referendum and say that we got it right. We have the opportunity now, potentially a once-in-a-lifetime one, to complete our constitution and create a chapter that reflects a modern, fair country that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Jeff McMullen is a journalist and a filmmaker, and he's been working uh, that job for almost 50 years. That's hard to work out, isn't it? Uh, and uh, he's been campaigning that long for the rights of Indigenous people around the world uh, throughout his professional life. Uh, he adjusted his schedule to be with us tonight, so thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Peter. And good evening everyone. We are on Aboriginal land and in acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, we are really going to the essence of what this whole discussion tonight is about. It is about the First People and their relationship and their law that expresses in an eternal way their being, their essence 
of what it is to be here in this Aboriginal country. When we say we're on Aboriginal country, it is a good reminder that we are now all invited to try to understand that custodial way of thinking of not only but being part of and in the comings and goings of those first people through 60,000 years or more, there is the evidence in history that Aboriginal people, when they were not called that, when they had names of the place, when they had names in their languages, that they understood this is the law that makes sense of being here. It is the world's oldest unbroken story of the development of human knowledge and understanding. And that is what we need to prize. We do need to find the language of the First People to make this document that describes our nation now understand the longer timelines. As all three speakers have said, we need to be truthful. We need to end the discrimination. We need to remove the stain of racism that is on this white supremacist document. It is not the Constitution that represents the values of most Australians today, but it is the document by which we define ourselves as a nation. So we all individually have the choice. Do we want this document to define us individually, collectively? in our community, in Ashfield, or across this nation? Is it your constitution? In my family, my children, one who is now studying law and one who has just begun at university, we discuss this in terms of what is the truth? What is the history that is left out? As George Williams said, the exclusion and denial that is seeping out of this document is very disturbing. So when George's seven-year-old comes soon to look at this, he will go through what my boy and girl, Claire and Will, do. When you listen to Aboriginal people, as no doubt George's child will do, and then ask your parents, how can this be? Captain Cook didn't discover Australia, children ask us. And that far back is where the deceit and the denial and the great problem with the nation, a modern nation, not the ancient nations, ancient societies, the longer timelines of history, but this modern nation is built in a constitutional sense on deceit, a sleight of hand, looking right through people as James Cook did, who were there, but even with those orders, he looked right through them and was still able to see some, someone, even though it was deep in his journal after he left Possession Island, he noted, contrary to how they may look, he did express that they are happier than we are in Europe. <laughs> Despite that contradiction, he never negotiated the treaty that not only in the coal, but most Aboriginal people today long for the recognition that they are still of this land. So that shakiness, that denial, the exclusion, is older than the Constitution that we have been handed from Britain. It is in fact older than the white supremacist, white Australia policy that shaped the thinking of the so-called Founding Fathers. These are not the Founding Fathers of that older sense of nationhood. That once we come to the truth, we can then set ourselves free of those shackles. We can see the problems with this disturbing constitution is that it is in fact drawn up on principles of racial supremacy that have been rejected even by scientists today. But common sense, even at that time, would have said terra nullius was deceit. These people had an attachment to land. Cook and Banks understood that. But there were other political objectives. And the truth is that politics overrides common sense and it certainly tramples humanity 
It is God doing that all the way through the relationship between a country that, as Michael Kirby says, constitutionally speaking, is still a white Australia. So in the relationship between the white Australia sense of nationhood and the First Peoples, we are still lost in denial. So I'm guided first in looking at what is possible by saying, what do the First People want? When you read the Expert Committee's excellent report, you will see in the appendix a clear acknowledgement that the overriding concerns of most Indigenous people today, Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander people, all of the First Nation people through various polls have expressed that health, education and sovereignty is their prime concern. Recognition of their rights to achieve equality in those areas and to have recognition of their sovereignty, of their right to self-determination. These are the issues that the First Peoples say are of greatest concern. So with the process of reconciliation and recognition at present, we have these worrying political realities. In fact, the expert committee has formalised them. In saying what is political possible now, we have in fact very clearly said that even though Aboriginal people would have other priorities, we can't get to them yet. So George advises pragmatism, and that's what history teaches us. Michael Kirby would say, history would also say, our deep conservatism and the failure of so many <coughs> referenda will show this is a massive challenge with such a short preparation time to convince, even with the Conservative government, that we are going to have the bipartisan support and, crucially, the political leadership to bring real change and to end the genuine oppression. The truth is, as Nicole pointed, the discrimination that exists today is what angers most Aboriginal people. They do not trust anymore words that are written into our nation's laws because those laws, as George outlined, have been dismissed, ignored, excised. You know, we found ways to get around something as sacred as the Racial Discrimination Act. If we are going to oppress people while that law exists, we've had uh, a Senate hearing where six people turned up to continue 10 more years of that discrimination in the Northern Territory. The contempt of our federal parliament, really for the rights of Aboriginal people, is appalling. So don't hold your breath and hope that most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are really going to trust that this particular change, these incremental steps, are going to end the depression, oppression, are going to bar the discrimination the warning signs so far from the Abbott government, from the Attorney General and others have been that there is great hesitancy about even, even having an explicit bar on discrimination. So by all means, we should be urgently looking at an archaic document, cleaning off the stain of racism, ending those two sections that use race, white supremacist thinking, to load a government with all kinds of power that occasionally is used, not for the benefit of Aboriginal people, but clearly to their detriment, that should not really be a conversation the nation is having. Common sense tells us we have to change that. But be wary, unless there is genuine political leadership, the very pattern of history that Kirsten has just outlined, Thinking that we go to the nation, as we, uh, to the polls, to the referendum, as we did in 67, it was one of the first times that I voted, believing we are as a nation going to recognise the right of <coughs> the First Peoples to equality, and in a genuine sense, we are going to move to end the disadvantage. Those very laws that were introduced through that referendum, counting them in the census, and then giving the Commonwealth the power to make laws, was the very act that has trampled their rights all the way through to the intervention and on other occasions. So, 
should we morally support a referendum that does not capture the first legitimate priorities that first peoples hold today? I say the things are not exclusive. I believe what we do need is to keep a sophistication in our thinking about this. Quite rightfully, we are very skeptical of those people in the federal parliament, in all political parties. The pattern of history says trust and treachery. Have an apology, but pay no compensation. Pretend that you're going to give these people the vote, but then give them second class citizenship. That is the pattern of our history. Why would this federal parliament change? The true nature of this current parliament is shown in the debate about racial vilification. You know, if we, are, if we can't even define with confidence and clarity what is to vilify a First Nations person or a new migrant or someone of a different religion, if we can't get those things right and we're going to back away in a cowardly way from saying we are better than that in our diversity, we'll celebrate our diversity, then be very careful about thinking that putting words onto a piece of paper will change what is still in people's minds and in their hearts. Patrick Dodson warned that reconciliation is not really only formal agreements and plans and commitments by corporations. It is what is in the heart and in the mind. It is about making it genuine. And for that, each one of us needs to make this personal. So don't run away from the difficulty, but inform yourselves and then work selectively <coughs> to support those parts of the change that the First Peoples believe are going to genuinely make life better for them, that it will end some of the discrimination or reduce it, that it will prevent our federal parliament where, where we take action from actually carrying out these blatant trampling of the rights of the First Peoples, uh, explicit in the Northern Territory Emergency Response Act, very clearly aimed only at one race of people. That has to end. We have to remove the potential of that kind of lawmaking from our federal parliament. Finally, As George said at the beginning, it's a tedious document. This constitution has very little power, let alone poetry, when it comes to expressing what it is to be in the country that we see around us today. It has no intellectual substance reflecting that 60,000 year old story. So I read nothing in the expert committee's recommendations that captures the longer timelines of our history. It's not about preambular poetry. It is about recognising law and intellectual development and emptying our heads of the ascendancy that those that came in 1770 and then with the First Fleet gave us a terrible inheritance. We think we have shed ourselves of that. But that egalitarian conceit is mythical. We have to really learn by listening and studying and recognising there was law here defining this before the pyramids, before the Magna Carta, and before any English judge ever sat in a court or a, or a parliament back in London. Thank you. George that he was able to leave at 8.30. Uh, George, thank you. Nicole. Uh, I also promised you there's more time for questions and discussion. So, uh, yes. I made a commitment this week, everybody, that uh, I will not go into storytelling. I'm going to start by asking or, or affirming what people already talk about and also maybe 
asking a strategic question. Those people who were on Parliament House uh, lawns the other day, put up your hand in this room. I think uh, Telford's down there? No, the Telford's. Yes, there. I said, you were down at Parliament House when we were all down there together. I think that, you know, that was something else that the Uniting Church took and, and went forward with. Where we live, work and play, you know, within our institution. One of the things is what I've been saying lately and from the outcomes of the um, Parliament House uh, vigil that we had last week was that it was just lovely to see our young people uh, talking, you know, because I say I live for the day that I don't have to say much more. Our young people will be saying it and I've really seen evidence of that tonight. Thank you, Nicole and Kristen, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm very proud of you and um, the other young lady up there who did the acknowledgement and the rest of uh, non-Aboriginal people like Jeff and so on. We have to continue to work together and what I'm trying to, to do now in the work that I'm doing is encouraging people and I think we all need to take responsibility for that and I think Jeff summed it up very, very well in saying, you know, sort of get on with it. I think all of you were saying that to us. We're in a process. We've got to go step by step, and I think we have to build that trust, but we have to show respect for each other as we build mutual respectful relationships. And in mutual respect, respectful relationship building, there's no room for coercion, no room for wedge politics, no room for jealousy, envy or greed. And if we can get that through to our grassroots community, we will give them hope because there are people there that have this great sense of helplessness and hopelessness. But when you get alongside people, we need to listen with our hearts. People who are vulnerable will pick it up when you listen with your heart. Not when you're loitering with intent, with agendas that are just loaded with what's in it for me, hanging around corners listening to what community is saying and then running off and doing something. And I've seen too much of that in my life. I'm 68 now and I'm saying to people, my job was made redundant in May, but I'm not. <laughs> And when I say our people, I mean all our peoples in this land who are on the margins. The people who are giving me hope for my life and work from now on are people who have come through darkness of their lives where I was in a bit of a tunnel for the last year. And the people who have brought light to my life were those who were also searching for someone to listen. And I am having a ball. Getting out there and sitting down with anybody who wants to have a yarn. So we all have our bits to do, and but it delights me to know that we won't have to worry about doing things like this so much anymore because we have young people whose voices are going to come up strong and you will keep to the agendas and you will you will make everybody, you know, sort of think without doing too much storytelling. And, and I now have gone into too much of the storytelling. But the thing is, I just want to encourage that we all just get on with it, do what we can, trusting that other people know more than we do about this whole process. And I respect that. And, um, but don't give up on those people who haven't got that voice. But we all do our bits where we are, wherever we live, work or play. Thank you. Thank you. Standing up, that's good. If you, if you have something to ask or say, please stand up and hold the microphone as if it's an ice cream. Yeah, my name is uh, William. I'm a proud uh, Murawari man from northwest New South Wales. Uh, I just first of all, I want to acknowledge the, uh, <coughs> the uh, gathering of people of the Aurora Nation. I just want to honor the traditional custodians of the land. I just want to pay respect to the eldest past and present. 
I just uh, want to pay respect to every other Aboriginal person and non Aboriginal person here tonight. I just want to thank uh, the, the Gadiga people for giving me the opportunity to speak on the land in the country tonight. Yeah, it's been a, you know, to, uh, to grow up back home in Brewer, and I grew up around some great leaders back home, uh, the late Essie Coffey and uh, Tombo Winners. And I travelled around with them a fair bit as a kid, such like I'm growing up, and uh, you know, I was always want to be a leader with my people and, and stand up for the rights of our people. And, you know, I've been in Sydney probably 17, 18 years now. I, I think the hardest thing in the last seven years, I, I've been at work with the racism in the workplace with Sydney Water. You know, and uh, a lot of the problems out there was with the three supervisors and the construction manager. And, you know, I'm very gutted today because, you know, one of the things I want to do and and one of the things I'm, uh, I'm grateful for everyone here to be here tonight because, uh, you know, I don't think it's a hard thing to be recognised as, a, as the first people in this country, being a proud Aboriginal person. But, you know, for everyone to come along here tonight and support this uh, meeting here tonight, it make me so proud because, you know, to be able to work with stuff like that and, and all the stuff that I went through and uh, instead of going through, uh, I do a protest so, uh, against racism discrimination which will probably start in the next two, uh, two weeks down at part of the place. But uh, to be at work and stuff like that and uh, you know we talk about racism and you know stuff like that discrimination. I can't believe how the government is and, uh, and stuff like that and I always wonder you know whether we'll be able to give our rights. Will we ever get our rights in this country? You know because of all the stuff uh, you know we keep getting kicked in the guts and it's the same thing at my workplace. I was treated as a dirty scum of the earth black fella. And we treated that way today with the government and stuff like that. I'll probably think about the reconciliation march that they had a few years ago. And uh, I want to go one further this year because I had a vision and stuff like that. I wanted to have a march uh, and have a march every year because uh, what had happened was, you know, I had a vision uh, on the 7th of November 2010. And, you know, I want, uh, I want everyone here tonight, to you know, if, if they're not doing anything later in the year, and this is the only way to show the, uh, the Habit government how powerful and how strong we are as a movement to get our word across to them and to stand strong on all the stuff that we're talking about here tonight. But one of the things, uh, I just want to leave you with my vision and stuff like that. And I'm sure if anyone here tonight that, that wants to join in and join me on the committee because I want to set up a committee uh, to, uh, to set up a march uh, late in November, in November, I wanted to have on the 7th of November with my vision. And, uh, you know, uh, you know there's, there's a lot of things that I go through, you know, being uh, racially abused and, and discriminated in the workplace. And, and sometimes I'm sort of lucky to be here because, you know, the effect that it's had and the impact that it's had on my life. But uh, I just want to go uh, with the vision and, uh, and you know, like I said, if you can talk to me after the meeting and stuff like that, but my vision that I had, uh, it, it goes something like this. Growing up on an Aboriginal mission, one mile out of my own town in Brewarna, my heroes and idols were my mum and dad who still respected me as a child. My other heroes and idols were the Aboriginal families, the elders that I grew up around. My other heroes and idols were the Yvonne Gooligans, the Lionel Roses, the Freedom Riders who fought for the justice of the Aboriginal people. But my other hero and idol was Martin Luther King. Murray had a dream, I had a vision on the 7th of November 2010, going back to my own town of Rewarren on the XPT train between Bathurst and Orange. The vision came to me as plain as day. It was embedded in my head. I had enough time to get a pen out of my bag and write the vision on the back of my train ticket. And the vision was to my people, to my people, the people of Australia. To my people, sorry, to my people, the Aboriginal people of, this, of Australia, of this country. To my people, the Aboriginal people of this country, to the Australian people, to the immigrants who crossed our four shores and called Australia home, I want you all to take a stance and to stand and fight racism, discrimination in the community, in the workplace, on sporting fields or wherever, and let us all embrace one another and walk together side by side, shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, holding hands and go together as one. Thank you.
say that I'm the white uh, population. And I um, had said to me just last weekend, why do we need to say sorry? Our, our people were taken in Germany. Our lands were taken. So why do we need to say sorry to the Aboriginal? I was walking down the street in, a, in an Aboriginal shirt. And the fellow in the restaurant where I went to get some food said, what do you want? As if I was an Aboriginal. So racism's alive and well. And there's a lot of rednecks out there who would like to put the Constitution back in the box. But as a white person, I think the recognised thing is wonderful because it's taught me. It's introduced me to the Aboriginal community and what the land means to the Aboriginal, what their history means to the Aboriginal. I've been a member of ANTA for probably 15 years. I've been a member of the Dara community, but I never really understood what this means to the Aboriginal people. And if you can get that message through this constitutional um, campaign, let it be. Let you get the right questions so that the rednecks of our community who would put the Aboriginals back in their box, get defeated. Because this is so important. It's the beginning. We've had the, the, the apology, which was a beginning. We've had this. But the white community had the Aboriginals in a stereotype. They said, great to the, new, the Northern Territory intervention. We don't want the children... Um, you know, um, um, put down or hurt or sexually abused. Or, but it had nothing to do with it. They wanted the land. They wanted the mineral rights. Has anything changed? I saw Utopia the other day. Nothing's changed. I went up, up centre of Australia travelling in a caravan. Nothing's changed. The Alice Springs Aboriginals still don't have a seat to sit in, and neither did us, us oldies either. They had to go down to the park to sit or sit in the gutter. Nothing's changed. It has to change. We have to have our beautiful young Aboriginal people presenting their part, their case, it has to happen. We have to recognise our Aboriginal heritage because their heritage is my heritage. Their attachment to the land is my attachment to the land. I love this land. I do not want these rednecks to win. I do not want discrimination. I want equal rights for everybody. I want good health. I don't want the Aboriginal brothers and sisters dying 20 years younger than the white people because their health is not looked after. The kids, I'm a part of Exodus, which has a school in the Northern Territory for the Aboriginal children to learn. And the Territory government wouldn't let the kids out of school to go and into this part of this program. They have now. But I want the kids educated. I want the health. So anything this campaign does, even if you don't get the referendum, that information and knowledge out there, and let's have a march, and let's get the people stirred up as part of the community. Me again. Uh, 
a few some that I would love to, but sometimes I've got to go out and I, every, every single day of my life, all the races of every day of my life. And I see, it makes me cry when I see um, Chinese get abused on a daily basis. I get to see Indians on a daily basis um, being vilified. I get vilified every single day of my life, every time I go out on the train. And to some of the um, support agencies I go to, I've got to get there, you know. I've got to live my, my, my thinking now is I've got to live my life and get out there and still live my life while I'm alive. And then I go to my interagency meet, meetings and um, out to IDAS, it's an indigenous disability, they're an advocacy group. I would have been, I would have been um, homeless and living on the streets but, but for those support agencies, um, IDAS. Um, um, I did a painting out there, um, my Aboriginal art, and I love, I love doing it. You know, not just because I'm um, selling it and now I've sold one. I was quite happy it was my first painting I've ever sold. And um, I, I did turtles. Um, um, haven't, haven't, I copyrighted it all, but I haven't, haven't got into the habit of continuing having a photographing it in my mobile phone. Um, but I, I know it belongs to me, and I hope I, I do have a, you know, one day I'd I'd like to have my own art um, little art space. But all the paintings are at home, and sometimes I take them out and I show them to people. And yeah, I, lo I love my paintings. Yeah. from the Sutherland Reconciliation Group. Um, I, the thing that troubles me actually is um, I think it's totally um, essential that we get recognition and we have that in our constitution uh, for all our wellbeing, for all our mental health, for the whole country. Uh, I also think it's totally vital that we recognise and use the intellectual property of 60,000 years of caring for land, because we certainly can't go on for many more years the way we've, we've been. But the thing that I'm concerned about is how um, we have a constitution that doesn't embed um, any sort of discrimination, but at the same time enables uh, Aboriginal people to um, access health, education and those sorts of things necessary to close the gap, etc. I, I don't, I'm not sure how all that can happen um, and I hope it is possible and maybe um, some of you know just the process of this drafting of what the Prime Minister is going to release in September or whatever how that can be ensured, I'm not sure quite what that document is, um, but no doubt there's a process, I heard someone talking about um, submissions to it, and um, is there, uh, is there a way that that can be, um, had the, have the right sort of input from Aboriginal people's point of view? Um, I'm not sure that uh, we have the answer to that, but I mean that's the big question that's been raised tonight, what exactly the changes are going to be put by the Abbott government. So we've been encouraged to find out as much as we can and take every opportunity to put forward positive uh, input to that process. Um, yep. Okay. So we don't know the process. Well, exactly. I don't think any of us here do. At the moment, as I understand it, there is a parliamentary committee uh, looking at the wording of the question, uh, and that's I think that's about all we know at the moment. Yeah. So we've got to keep our vigilance. There, there is no proposal for a constitutional forum of no. the people. So the great risk is that we'll get some form of a replay of 1900 leading up to the 1901, which will exclude many voices and many perspectives, because the House of Representatives will shape the wording of a resolution, 
and their committee has considered things just as the expert advisory committee, which was appointed by government, not through the democratic process, appointed by government. So we, we have not had an open process other than, yes, we the citizens were free to write to the expert committee and, and make a recommendation. But those are just some of the questions we don't know. As Nicole said at the outset, we do not know what the government's position will be. There are worrying signs that it will be minimalist, and there are even more disturbing signs that they're cautious about uh, a block on discrimination to try and formalise some kind of uh, prevention there. But those are the questions really to press our own local members and the Prime Minister and the, uh, the Indigenous Advisory Council. You know, we've got to really apply some grassroots democracy or we will be excluded. At the moment, we're really not in the process. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, thank you everyone for your participation. And uh, we want to thank our speakers. Thank you very much for being up here. In your program, you'll see a song that Helen has written called Write the First Chapter. I do acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation and pay my respect to their elders. Just a Quick word, the instigation for this song came from again watching the film Lee and Yara and hearing Pat Dodson talking about the fact we can't keep telling lies. And the other bit that's there is that recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the Constitution is a bit like writing the first chapter of the Constitution. It's like the first chapter was left out and this is a chance to write it. Uh, you won't have heard this before, except for the people on the planning committee with whom I had a bit of a dry run a week or so ago. Uh, other than that, this is the first time it's been a public. <coughs> but it's a simple tune, so I invite you to join in as Peter said the words are there in your programs. <laughs> Write the first chapter and write the next chapter We can't build a nation of lies Write the first chapter and write the next chapter This land can hold all of our lives Write the first chapter and write the next chapter We can't build a nation of lies Write the first chapter and write the next chapter